When I recently rewatched Over the Garden Wall, it was an extremely nostalgic experience for me. Not only because it's been around six years since I've watched the series, but also because the atmosphere of the unknown is constantly radiating with a sort of nostalgic energy, for lack of a better term. When watching Over the Garden Wall, you're almost definitely going to pick up on a lot of references to early America, such as the fairy or the gristmill. However, there's a lot more about the show that gives it its nostalgic tone. First off, there are so many characters who have a longing for their past or a fear of their future. But while the idea of nostalgia is both implemented in the character drama and the setting of the show, it's also implemented in the creative process by which the show was made. A lot of the voice actors have played major roles in blockbusters, but haven't really appeared in much recently. And whether that aspect was intentional when casting these actors or not, either way it affected my experience. And the animation style is reminiscent of Rubber Hose and Hanna-Barbera animation. Sometimes the series subtly displays inspiration from these animation styles using modern animation techniques, such as the way they have large round eyes with no irises, but there are also blatant references to all sorts of classical material, both animation and live action, both visually and audibly, Well, he's the butcher. I'm the butcher. The baker. Yeah! The midwife. <coughs> the master and apprentice. The tailor. <laughs> and I'm the tavern keeper. And on the topic of sound, the original soundtrack is undeniably supposed to be reminiscent of the past, using a huge variety of old musical styles and even using Latin in a track. <laughs> While the series is animated digitally, rather than using cells and paintings, it's definitely a homage to other methods of animation, with simple, cartoony-looking characters on top of backgrounds that are made to imitate watercolors and pastels. The color palette in general is much darker than most other animated shows being made at this period of time. However, the clearest example of this series' attachment to the past is in this interview with series creator Pat McHale. I grew up in New Jersey, and the seasons that happened over there were something that when I came out to California, I started missing more and more, and I didn't really expect to. So the show has like a fall theme that kind of goes to winter as it changes. This interview to me makes it clear that a sense of nostalgia was a huge part of the show's inception. And after all of my examples, you can probably tell that I believe that that idea of nostalgia continued to persist as a prevalent aspect of the show during its entire production. At its core, I believe Over the Garden Wall is about nostalgia. It was the most important part of the series to me on my recent rewatch. I'm MichaelMan2000, and this is my video on... I think Over the Garden Wall is one of the most memorable and unique shows I've ever seen. I mean, after seven whole years, I'm still motivated to rewatch it. I don't really watch many animated shows, but for some reason, this one really stuck with me. It feels like a classic made decades ago, with some great character arcs, a lot of clever setups and payoffs, and it's all structured very well. The entire series is only 10 episodes long, and each one is only around 11 minutes, and I think the fact that the show is so brief makes the story feel extremely concise. From the beginning of the show, it's so easy to become engaged because it's all very mysterious and atmospheric. The series starts off with two brothers, Wart and Greg, lost in the woods, which is referred to as the unknown. It's an extremely clever place to start the show off. You don't know where these characters are, how they got there, when this takes place, and how similar it is to reality. It's a very appropriate way to withhold information from the audience, since it helps you understand what the characters are going through, because they're lost and confused too. And that kind of mystery keeps the audience engaged. The series is full of instances like this, where information is given in an order to maximize impact. I feel like making this show only 10 episodes long was a pretty great choice, since every episode is pretty self-contained, and they work as little vignettes along Wart and Greg's journey. And there's another reason that I'll talk about in the spoiler section of this video. Another thing I want to mention is the animation. The backgrounds look great. The digital renditions make very convincing paintings and animation cells, and a lot of it just looks gorgeous. Like this shot in episode 2. That looks great! How do you even do that? Another thing about the animation that's great is the character designs, specifically of Wart and Greg. And what makes them great is actually pretty simple. It's their shapes. A lot of the time animators will try to make major characters look more memorable by giving them unique shapes. And I think if animators are able to do this successfully, then that probably means they did a pretty good job. One way you can tell is if you make the characters silhouettes. I would be able to tell which characters these are after not seeing the show for seven years just by seeing the silhouettes. Let's try this out with some other animated characters. <laughs> 
you know what show these characters are from just by looking at their shapes, and you can differentiate which character is which. You can do the same with these four characters, and this group, or these two. I think these are all examples of great character designs. Now how about these guys? Can you tell which movies these guys are from? Yeah, I kinda doubt it. I would not be able to tell which one of these three movies these characters are from, because their designs aren't unique or stylish or memorable in any way. Another thing that's great about the designs of Wart and Greg is how you're able to understand everything you need to about these characters just by looking at them. Humans instinctively find things that are more round to be more appealing, and things that are sharper to be more unappealing. It's a natural instinct we've evolved to have, that way we avoid sharper objects that could be dangerous to us. You can see how this is used in the character designs in their hats. Greg has a curvy, more rounded hat to look more friendly and appealing, while Wart has a much more pointy red hat. That's another thing about the character designs of Wart and Greg, is how they're colored. Wart is wearing more muted, darker tones, while Greg is wearing lighter, brighter tones. I also think it was a clever choice to have Wart wear a cape, because it shows he's a more nervous, insecure character who isn't as willing to open up as Greg is. There is a relatively clever twist at the end that reveals why they're wearing these clothes. I say relatively because I thought it was kind of a cheap way to make these characters' origins a bit more inconspicuous. But whatever, I'm glad they're wearing these outfits, and I think it fits their characters much better than just normal clothes or something. Also, on the topic of character design, the villain in the show has one of the greatest character designs I have ever seen. It takes the whole silhouette thing to another level. Another thing I want to mention in the non-spoiler section of this video is the character relationships. And the best comedy in the show is derived from the relationships of characters. The contrast between Wart and Greg is great. <gasps> Who are you? We're burglars! No, 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 we're not. We're not. We, we just needed to get out of the rain and, and we, we thought this place was abandoned, so... So we came here to burgle your turts. No, it's, it's not true. It is true! <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> See? And the evolution of the relationship between Wart and Beatrix is one of my favorite things about the show, and I think it's handled in a much more mature way than most shows like this. It's also really hilarious how much they hate each other at the start. Okay, Wart, I'll admit it. You seem like a pushover, but you're not. Oh? Deep down in your heart, you're a stubborn jerk. When are you gonna give this up? Maybe never. Maybe I'll never give this up. I think one of the ways you can tell a great episode from a weaker one is how well the newly introduced characters bounce off the protagonist. Also, while we're on the topic of character relationships, we should probably talk about the lack of a character relationship the Woodsman has and how telling that is. The Woodsman doesn't really talk to any other characters than Wart and Greg, and he only talks to them for a little bit. He's consumed by his work, and because of that, he isolates himself from other people. Is there anything else that's great about the show that I can mention in the spoiler-free part of this video? The music. Obviously I can't show much of it in this video, but the song that starts the show off and the one that caps it are both very similar and they're both fantastic. Also the one that starts and the one that ends episode 9 are two of my personal favorites. Another thing I like about the show is all the foreshadowing and all the little details, such as the way every episode starts off with the sound of a train. Weird thing I want to mention, I actually own this pair of scissors. It's a bit of a family heirloom. My grandmother bought it when she was a child in Italy. I'm finding it really weird that I own this stuff. Like in the Opal video, I happened to own an Opal that I could show, and now I own this random pair of scissors. Is it just a coincidence, or do I just own a bunch of stuff? I don't know. But what I do know is my grandmother was born in 1928, so she probably bought this in the 1930s, which I'm guessing this is a common scissor design for the time. Or this would just be too crazy a coincidence. Alright, yeah, I looked it up. They're a popular design for embroidery. That actually makes a lot of sense in the context of the show. Anyways, I, j I just thought it was cool. Also, it gave me a better understanding of when the show takes place, and maybe the scissors and other things were put into the show to make the occasional audience member say, Hey, I, I know that thing, my grandmother or something owns one of those. I mean, it fits in line with the whole nostalgia aspect of the show, and personally, it made the series way creepier and way more memorable for me. Anyways, that's about it for the non-spoiler part of this video. If you still haven't seen the show, you should definitely check it out, because as I've said multiple times in this video, it's very good. It's on HBO Max right now and Hulu, so if you're looking for a place to watch it, those are two places. Just watch it. It's, it's, it's really good. I get a thumbs up from me. After watching this show, there are quite a few themes and ideas you can take away from it. But I think what keeps people thinking about the show is the main question most people will leave the show asking. What exactly was the unknown? And I think the most basic answer to that question is pretty simple. It's some sort of afterlife. 
You could also probably say it's all a dream that the two characters have when they drowned in the lake, but that wouldn't really explain the ending. And yeah, I know it's supposed to be one of those twists that makes you question whether it's real or fantasy, but probably the best piece of evidence is that you can see Quincy Endicott's gravestone in the graveyard before they fall into the lake. And it also explains why the unknown is so old-fashioned. The community around the show has done a pretty great job at figuring out all sorts of details and discoveries that make the show make more sense. One of the more interesting discoveries is the show's link to 14th century Italian poem Dante's Inferno. Each episode has a link to each one of the nine circles of hell, other than the first episode, which is just sort of an introduction. It's part of why the show being 10 episodes long was such a clever choice, and it's why the episodes are so self-contained. The second episode is Limbo, with Pottsfield's lack of conflict. The third one is Lust, with Miss Langtree's obsession over her missing lover. The fourth episode is Gluttony, with the tavern. The fifth episode is Greed, with the Quincy Endicott Manor. The sixth episode is Anger, with the anger caused by Beatrice's betrayal. The seventh episode is Heresy. The eighth is about violence. While there isn't a ton of violence in the main story, the Ring of Violence in the Inferno also includes self-inflicted violence, such as suicide, which fits pretty well thematically, since Wart just kinda gives up, and Greg literally gives himself up to the beast. And while the ninth episode doesn't take place in the unknown, it fits pretty well with the layer of fraud in the Inferno. Also, having it be set on Halloween is a pretty neat touch because obviously Halloween costumes fit in line with fraud, and the penultimate episode is treachery. There are also some details like how the beast is made out of lost souls, which I believe is similar to a lot of other depictions of the devil. Also, his soul being in a lantern is pretty similar to, you know, Inferno, Fire, Lantern, you get it. There are some other details, like how there's a character named Beatrice in Dante's Inferno, but I don't think I really need to mention every detail for this video. This channel did a pretty in-depth summary, and I'll put a link in the description if you're interested. Anyways, I think it's all a very clever way to structure the show, and I think taking things from Dante's Inferno is a great way to make the unknown into a more reminiscent underworld. Although, even after all of that, I still am not convinced that the unknown is an inferno or a hell. I still think that the unknown is more of a sort of purgatory. Almost every episode is about a new cast of characters who are in fear and are in a permanent conflict that is solved by them either owning up to their sins or overcoming their fears in some way with the help of Wharton Gregg. This to me is an afterlife that is tailored to the individual, that relates to their sins in life, and will test their will to overcome it. If they give up like Wart and Greg do in the 8th episode of the show, then they are taken in by the devil, or the beast, and are made into Edelwood trees, which are burned into the lantern, and again taken hold of by the beast. If you don't give up and overcome your problems, you get to live in a sort of paradise in the unknown. If you don't commit sins or good deeds, then you live in the limbo that is Pottsfield. Or maybe Pottsfield is some ultimate afterlife that everybody goes to. I'm not really sure, but this line makes it a little more confusing for me. And what about you? You sure you want to leave? Me? Yes! Oh well, you'll join us someday. Uh... Whether or not you give up seems to be the most important aspect in deciding your fate in the unknown. It's why Greg says this multiple times at the end of the show. But anything is possible if you set your mind to it, right? And that philosophy seems to be the reason why he's rewarded with this sort of heaven. It's also twisted in the last episode, with Greg being told not to give up by the Beast. The Beast's reasoning for this is because he knows Greg will have to give up before the sun sets, because it's freezing cold. It's also very interesting that this heaven and a wart becoming an Edelwood tree both occur when they're sleeping. Falling asleep or passing out seems to have some sort of link to giving up in the unknown. In this context, Wart literally gives up on his journey and decides to stop looking for his way home. Also, when Greg is freed from becoming an Edelwood tree, it's because he's awoken and doesn't give up. Deciding not to give up on life is really Wart's character arc. Because he's so nervous and insecure, he just runs away from his problems, and therefore, his life, sending him into the unknown. When he gives up on his life both times in the show, he ends up in a cold lake. And when he's able to overcome his problems, he leaves the lake. Also, body temperature and seasons seems to play a big role in representing this character's emotions. At the midpoint of the show, when the character is betrayed, the seasons change. One of the most telling things about this character is in the ninth episode. Also, having this episode be the ninth episode was really clever because it shows our characters at their most flawed states right before the penultimate episode where their character arcs are complete. Like I said, this character runs away from his problems and because of that, he drowns in a lake. But it's important to understand that the things he runs away from are all non-problems basically twisted by this character's insecurities. He likes a girl named Sarah, but he's pessimistic about the whole situation because he thinks someone of her status wouldn't like someone like him. But it turns out that she's just a dork. He's really worried about walking into a party he wasn't invited to, but in actuality, everybody there likes him. It kind of reminded me of Adaptation. I've got to stop sweating. Can she see it dripping down my forehead? Oh, she looked at my hairline. She 
Thanks, I'm bald. You think you're great? Oh, wow. Thanks. That's, that's nice to hear. And the funniest moment in the entire show for me is how Wart learns that high school Chad, Jason Funderburger, is gonna ask out Sarah. And Wart is freaked out, but he decides to confront this jock. Hey, Sarah. Are you ready to go? Hey, Jason Funderburger. Oh, hey, Wart. Let's go, Sarah. Uh -oh. You coming, Wart? Hilarious. It's cool to see Wart's confidence grow as the series continues, and how he isn't even nervous about things like Jason Funderburger by the end. This episode also touches on some of Greg's flaws. His main arc in the show is he learns to think about others more, or maybe he learns to accept people for who they are, and stop going off on his own, and stop focusing on himself so much. I mean, in episode 9, he just kind of wants Wart as a frog-catching partner. But obviously, he's the most innocent character in the show, and he really isn't even that flawed in this episode. The other two characters with great overarching character arcs are Beatrice and the Woodsman. They're basically two sides of the same coin. One way the show displays this is by having them never interact. Beatrix flies away when the Woodsman finds the characters, and we don't see her again until after the boys leave the Woodsman's mill. Then, when the Woodsman returns, Beatrice is unconscious, and she doesn't regain consciousness until after they leave the Woodsman. And we don't see the Woodsman again until Beatrice and the boys split up. Finally, the gristmill is abandoned by Beatrice's family when the Woodsman finds it and uses it. And once he abandons the mill, Beatrice's family returns to it. The reason for this is because their character arcs directly oppose each other. Beatrix got her entire family turned into bluebirds because of her thoughtlessness, and on her journey to return her family into human form, she avoids them. While the woodsman is too obsessed with his family, to the point where he doesn't think about himself. When Beatrice decides to return to her family, she's immediately rewarded with the scissors. And when the woodsman decides to risk his daughter's soul by blowing out the lantern, he's immediately rewarded by getting to return to her. That completes their character arcs. And a lot of the side characters have similar arcs to this, they're just less overarching. Also, I want to mention that this scene where the woodsman blows out the lantern is hands down the best scene in the entire show. It's the Eye of the Duck. Also, Wart letting the woodsman blow out the candle perfectly fits the idea that each member of the Unknown has to overcome their problems themselves. Goodbye, Beatrice. Goodbye, Wart. You know, I bet some of you are saying to yourselves, Wow, Michael, man, you sure are gushing about this miniseries. Is there anything you don't like about it? And the answer is... Yes. There's actually a few things I don't like about this show. There are two episodes in the show that I think are significantly weaker than the rest. They aren't bad, but they're just not as good. Episode 3 is pretty tonally inconsistent with the rest of the show. It's just way goofier and more lighthearted. And because of that, it kind of stands out. And I think the newly introduced characters in this episode really don't have the same draw as most other characters in the show. They're also incredibly corny, which I know is kind of the point because it's all sort of a tribute to classical things, but overall, this episode is just so much less interesting to me than the rest of the show. I think part of the reason why there's a lot of goofy episodes rather than creepy ones is because Cartoon Network didn't want children to be too scared, which is kind of understandable, although when I read the concepts for some of the episodes that were never made because they were too creepy, it makes me a little disappointed some of these scarier episodes never came into fruition. There was gonna be an episode about a dude who made dice from children's bones, and as a kid that would probably terrify me, but nowadays that sounds kind of freaking sweet! As for the other episode I didn't really love, Episode 5 also isn't very memorable for me, in comparison to the rest of the show at least. I like the newly introduced characters better in this one, although Fred the Horse is kind of a pointless inclusion, and he's a little too goofy for the tone of the show. He already stole a horse. Hey guys. Although I'm kind of glad they included him because he is admittedly hilarious. Fred's a talking horse, he can do whatever he wants. I want to steal. The concept of this episode is pretty good, but these episodes just feel like they have a lot less purpose than the rest of the overarching story. And that's okay, I guess. I like the fact that every episode is just sort of a little vignette along their journey, and maybe these episodes are just a bit of levity. Like, this show kinda needs it. It goes into some pretty dark places for a kid's show. However, I think the episode Babes in the Woods does a much better job of levity in comparison. Just because it's in the middle of five pretty dark, dramatic episodes, and Babes in the Wood itself has some really dark moments. Maybe not all of these episodes have to have a purpose, the majority of Babes in the Woods doesn't, except it's super annoying how in episode 5 there's an overarching purpose that's undercut by the end of the episode so there can be drama in the next one. 
Although, I really like the bits with Wart and Beatrice in these episodes. Their relationship grows a lot in the fifth one especially, which is important for the sixth episode. And I also just enjoy their chemistry. So don't skip these episodes, they're just not as good as what the rest of the show has to offer. Which is a pretty good thing to be criticizing. Although there is one other thing that I really don't like about this show, which is that this series has some really amateur audio mixing and editing. The worst example of this is in episode 7. The characters go from inside to outside where it's raining, the blocking of the characters change, the distance between the camera and the characters shift, the distance between the characters change multiple times, and throughout all of this, the audio from the characters' voices sounds exactly the same, and it sounds so artificial. It just sounds like the characters are in a recording booth throughout the entire show. Wes Anderson does this thing in his animated movies, where he brings his actors to environments that are similar to the ones in the movie with a boom mic and records the dialogue that way, to avoid this issue. It's important to applaud projects that take this kind of thing into consideration. Now obviously I don't expect every animated project that has dialogue to do this, but just a little audio mixing and editing would have been nice to make this problem a lot less noticeable. You know, that's what most professional animated things do. Also, there's a lot of moments where you can clearly tell that there are cuts between multiple takes. Greg, I do have a plan. And if you don't trust me, then you don't have to follow me, okay? If you want to go look for Beatrice, go ahead. You can do anything you want. I mean, maybe I'm wrong and Elijah Wood just talks really fast, but I'm pretty sure that's just multiple takes being way too close together. And if you separated them a little more, it would have sounded a lot less phony, although that may be me being hypocritical. There's a scene at a party where everybody is talking pretty quietly, even though there's supposed to be loud music and people talking in a small space. Why are you talking to them? Oh, hey, guys. I don't know what he said, but it, it wasn't true. Oh, Hayward, how's it going? Uh, hi. Like, again, that sounds really, really phony. Maybe you should have your actors speak louder, so when you add music and posts, it'll sound much more realistic. Like this scene in The Social Network. And yeah, I know this dorky high school party isn't supposed to be even close to as loud. However, I think if they talked a little bit louder, it would have made the difference and make it sound a lot less artificial. Also, I just noticed this as I was editing this video. In this scene, there's a frame of animation where they forgot to put it in the background. Like, c come on, really? <laughs> but at the end of the day, I still think Over the Garden Wall is fantastic. Warts and all. Y you get it? Even if there's some bad audio mixing, and it's a little too tonally inconsistent for my taste, those really aren't very big problems. The premise, the character arcs, the clever setups and payoffs, the way it's structured, the visual style, the character design, the original score, the mystery of it all, it was all super entertaining and memorable. And that stuff is so much more important, and overall it's just a great show, and I would gladly rewatch it over and over again. Well, I guess I finally made another video. How, how long has it been? What month was my last video? Oh, it, uh, November. November? What? I really wanted to make something that the people who subscribed to my Opal video would enjoy, and I thought Over the Garden Wall would be a pretty good choice because it's pretty similar to Opal in a lot of ways. They're both animated, they're both creepy, although one is much more kid-friendly than the other. They both have a sort of old-fashioned quality to them, and they're both pretty interesting to talk about. It also took me a while to figure out what angle I wanted to take with this video. I was originally going to do something more similar to my Opal video, where I did more of an analysis and explanation, but there were already some good videos on YouTube that basically did the same thing, and I didn't want to be derivative of them, so I just decided to do more of a review recommendation thing. But it took me a while to get there. Anyways, my next video will be the one on Dark Souls, the one I've talked about making for like a year now. Although it really helps me if I get some suggestions, so if there's any movie, show, short, or game you want me to talk about, let me know in the comments, I'd really appreciate it. Anyways, thank you guys for watching, and big thank you for 2,000 subscribers. I'll see you on the next one. Bye!